December 23rd, less than two days until Christmas. The happiest time for all children as they eagerly await the holiday. But for one large family, this day began with an overwhelming sense of fear. A young girl had vanished without a trace from her room, where her sister slept nearby, and other brothers and sisters were on the other side of the wall. Sarah Foxwell was born on May 18, 1998, in Salisbury, Maryland. Sarah was a star in her sixth grade class. Bold, straightforward, yet fair. Our family had many tough days, but Sarah always smiled, no matter how bad things were. She was mature beyond her years, able to support and comfort, recalled Jennifer Foxwell, Sarah's mother. Jennifer was a single mother of many children. She claimed to have worked a lot and was forced to temporarily entrust her children to the care of her father and sister, Amy Fothergill, who lived together in a converted large barn. Amy was the legal guardian of all her sister's children, with a questionable reputation in the small town. Sarah was the middle child. There were eight other children in the large family. Sarah's siblings included four brothers and two sisters. On December 22, 2009, Sarah had a great day. Besides the fact that the Christmas holidays had recently begun and the holiday was still ahead, Jennifer, her biological mother, who worked overtime, promised that she would give the whole family a perfect Christmas that day. Sarah wrote a letter to Santa Claus, asking for Converse sneakers as a gift, and her mom said that Sarah would definitely find them under the Christmas tree. In the evening, the children had their favorite pizza for dinner. The entire family watched TV together, and Sarah saw that the long-awaited snow had started outside the window. So, it will be a white Christmas, Sarah said with uncontrollable excitement as she ran to the window, watching the snow cover the ground. Life seemed so fairy tale like enticing, and magical. Around 9 p.m., Sarah headed to her room, which she shared with her younger sister, Emma. Emma, excited by the snowfall, followed her eagerly. The girl's bedroom was at the end of a long hallway. The sisters quickly fell asleep, anticipating the next day, which was supposed to bring them closer to the holiday. At 7 a.m., Amy went into the girl's room to check on them. Emma was sleeping, but Sarah's bed was empty. Amy checked the other rooms, but all the children were still asleep. She searched the living room and the kitchen. Amy thought maybe Sarah had gone outside to play in the snow, but Sarah's outerwear was hanging on a hook, and her winter shoes were by the door. They were dry, indicating that no one had been outside in them. Amy checked around the barn, but there was no sign of the girl. She started to worry. Amy hurried back to the children and began waking them up. No one knew where Sarah was. Jennifer, Sarah's mother, received an anxious call from her sister at around 7.30 a.m. Sarah isn't in her room. Her shoes and jacket are here. She's not in the house or outside. We don't know where she is, Amy said. Jennifer rushed to their location, and Amy called the sheriff's department. Sheriff Mike Lewis of Wicomico County, Sergeant David Owens, and other police officers headed to the home of the worried family. There was no time to waste. It was cold outside, and that was far from the only danger. They needed to act quickly. There were no signs of forced entry, and no unfamiliar footprints were found. The snow might have erased them. The barn was surrounded by frozen fields on three sides, with a cold forest behind it. The nearest neighbors were over a kilometer away. One group of police officers started searching the surrounding extensive areas and questioning neighbors. Another group stayed inside the house. The front door and all the windows were securely locked. All of Sarah's belongings were in place, except for her green toothbrush and slippers, which were missing. Suddenly, Sarah's aunt, Amy, remembered that they kept a spare key outside in the garden under a ceramic frog. She ran outside and went to the hiding spot, but the key was not there. Amy couldn't say exactly when the key had disappeared or if it had been there yesterday or even a month ago. She couldn't recall the last time it had been used. The key unlocked the door to the garden, which was just a few steps from the girl's room, and the door was closed, but not locked. In this case, Amy was sure the door had been locked before. The family dog was in the garden. The dog wasn't barking. 
the dog only responded to people it knew well. Everything seemed as if Sarah had either left the house through the door next to her room on her own, or someone from the family had accompanied her, took her in an unknown direction, and then returned alone. There was a possibility that the child had been abducted. Although it was hard to imagine that someone would break into a house with 11 family members through a door protected by a dog and a locked door leading to the girl's room, where the girl wasn't alone, and take her from there. At any moment, someone could have come out of their room to use the bathroom or go to the kitchen. The children could have screamed, and so on. It was difficult to believe that the abductor was that audacious, and if someone did take such a risk, they must have known the family well and had access to the house. While the work at the scene continued, authorities issued an Amber Alert statewide. The Amber Alert system provides the public with immediate and up-to-date information about child abductions. In the United States, Amber Alerts are disseminated through commercial and public radio stations, the internet, satellite radio, television, and text messages. Alerts are also sent to citizens via email and commercial electronic billboards. The goal of the Amber Alert is to involve as many community members as possible in the search for the abducted child. Each citizen becomes the eyes and ears of law enforcement. The girl had gone to sleep in a pink shirt and pajama pants. A description of her appearance and clothing was transmitted to various agencies, and the Amber Alert system was activated. Sheriff Lewis of Wicomico County understood that trust couldn't be taken for granted, even in the most ideal families. During the search of the house, he closely observed everyone's behavior, especially the males. Sarah had adolescent brothers and a grandfather. He scrutinized them all with his keen eye. He could see that all family members were in a state of confusion bordering on panic. At that moment, it seemed to him that no one was behaving suspiciously. Sheriff Lewis approached Jennifer, Sarah's mother, embraced her, and said, I want you to know that I will do everything in my power to bring your daughter back home. Jennifer burst into tears. I need to talk to Emma, Sarah's younger sister, first, Sheriff Lewis continued. Emma was the last person to have seen the girl. She had been in the room with Sarah and might not have been sleeping and could have heard or even seen what had happened. However, Emma refused to talk. The morning disappearance of her sister had scared her, and she was initially afraid to admit what she knew. At that moment, Jennifer's mother, Emma's grandmother, arrived, and Sheriff Lewis noticed that Emma was particularly happy to see her. She ran to her grandmother's embrace first, indicating a strong bond between them. Sheriff Lewis asked the woman to have a private conversation with Emma. Meanwhile, he spoke to the others one by one. In private with her grandmother, Emma confirmed the worst fear. Sarah had been kidnapped. In the middle of the night, a man had opened the door to their room and entered. Emma and Sarah woke up. Sarah immediately sat up in bed and looked at him. Emma, pretending to be asleep, continued lying down. The man and her sister sat on the bed and spoke quietly. Emma watched and listened to every disturbing word the man said to her older sister. He persuaded her to go with him, and she agreed. The details of the conversation between the man and Sarah were never disclosed by the police, but it was known that Sarah willingly followed him, wearing slippers and a t-shirt, as if preparing for an adventure. Emma was not scared at all. She quickly fell asleep again because the sisters knew this man. He was dressed in blue jeans, an orange jacket, and white sneakers. It was Tommy, Emma said. Are you sure? Her grandmother asked, and the girl confirmed that she was. The woman approached the sheriff. All of this was so terrifying and strange because Tommy was a good family friend. Tommy was the former boyfriend of Aunt Amy. Upon learning this, Amy initially felt a sense of relief in the first few seconds until the full realization of this news dawned on her. Tommy, or Thomas Lex Jr., was a kind and friendly man who was well-liked by the family, especially Sarah. When Amy and Tommy were seeing each other, he often visited their home and spent a lot of time with the kids. Amy valued this and considered it an expression of his love for her, especially because she had many children and they were an integral part of her life. Unexpectedly, Tommy stopped coming around. His call ceased and he didn't respond to Amy's incoming calls. 
He simply disappeared, and they hadn't seen each other for a month. Everyone knew Tommy, including the sheriff's office. The police checked him against the database and discovered that 30-year-old Thomas Lex Jr. had a very dangerous criminal history. He was registered as a sex offender in both Maryland and neighboring Delaware. Over the course of 11 years while Sarah Foxwell was growing up, Thomas Lex was charged with five sex offenses against girls and young women. Lex earned his spot on the state sex offender registry after an incident in October over the 1997 Halloween holiday at a wooded park in Salisbury. According to court documents, 18-year-old high school student Thomas Lex met three girls in the park who introduced themselves and told him their ages. He spent the evening with them chatting and playing cards. He focused his attention on one of them. Lex held her hand, and when it got dark he started touching her under her clothes. I didn't say anything, I was scared, the girl told the police according to court documents. Afterward, Thomas called her several times, asking to meet, but she refused. The girl's parents contacted the police after learning about the incident by reading her diary. Lex confessed to the police, but added, she didn't act like she didn't like it. In a letter to the girl and her parents, Lex wrote, If I had known before this that she was 12 years old, I certainly would not have contacted her at all. In May 1998, Thomas Lex pleaded guilty to third-degree sexual offense and was sentenced to five years. Just about four months later, he was released for good behavior. A year after his release, 20-year-old Thomas met two girls at a local shopping center and invited them to go outside to smoke with him. After being alone with them on the street, he started giving them compliments, saying that they looked cool and acted like adults. On the street, he began to make advances and touch them. The girls got scared and went back to the shopping center. Alex started following them. That night, the friends stayed over at one of their homes. Thomas Lex tracked them down. He knocked on their window and asked them to come outside. We were terrified that night. We couldn't sleep and were afraid he might break in, recalled one of the girls according to the court records. The girls were afraid to tell their parents about the stalker. About a week later, a school psychologist noticed that they seemed troubled. He invited the friends for a conversation, during which they shared their ordeal. The psychologist promptly contacted the police. During the court proceedings in October 2000, both girls who had been attacked testified against Lex. However, the jury found Thomas guilty of only one of the 18 charges, second-degree assault. Thomas Lex was sentenced to five years of imprisonment and 4.5 years for violating the terms of his parole. Later, this sentence was overturned by an appeals court, which ruled that detectives had used inadmissible interrogation methods. Thomas was then required to serve only the term for violating the conditions of his early release, which was 4.5 years. While this lengthy legal process in the shopping center case was unfolding, Lex was accused of raping another girl on a boardwalk in Delaware. The girl told the police that she was looking for her sister on the street at around 3 in the morning when 20-year-old Lex struck up a conversation with her. He then left but reappeared on her path after some time and subsequently assaulted her. According to court documents, the girl fought him and repeatedly told the suspect to stop, but it was all in vain. The very next day after the rape, Lex was sent to the custody center of Wicomico County. He was facing a second-degree rape charge, but Thomas Lex pleaded guilty to fourth-degree rape, a much less serious offense, as part of a plea agreement. It remains unclear why the prosecutor handling the rape case, Adam Gala, agreed to this deal. Gala declined to respond to numerous requests for explanations. In 2001, fourth-degree rape carried a penalty of up to 30 months of imprisonment. Thomas Lex was transferred to Maryland and remained incarcerated there until April 2003 when he was once again released early for good behavior. Soon after that, he began dating a woman who eventually became his wife, and they had a child together. On that same June day in 2004, when his newborn daughter returned home from the hospital with his wife, another incident occurred. Thomas Lex was walking around the neighborhood. On the porch of his neighbor's house was his young neighbor, accompanied by several teenagers. He struck up a conversation with her, called her wild, 
and then took a twig and slapped another girl in front of everyone. His neighbor immediately ran into the house and complained to her mother. In February 2005, the jury found Thomas Lex not guilty. It should be noted that according to state law, evidence of past convictions can only be presented in rare cases. Prosecutors warned Thomas's neighbor in court not to mention his status on the sex offender registry. The prosecution is prohibited from using prior convictions as evidence. According to defense experts, the accused can never receive a fair trial if the jurors are aware of his previous convictions. Therefore, jurors often have no knowledge of the fact that they may be dealing with a hardened repeat offender. In July 2006, shortly after filing for divorce, Lex's wife requested a restraining order. She wanted Thomas Lex to stay away from her and their daughter. In the court documents, she stated that Lex couldn't control his anger. Because their child fell ill, he punched the wall and threatened to kill both of them. The former wife told a reporter who came to her home that she didn't want to talk to the media until that jerk, as she called him, either died or was locked up for the rest of his life behind bars. Just a few months before Sarah's abduction, Lex was arrested again. In the late summer of 2009, a 24-year-old woman met Lex at a pub where he was considered a regular and the life of the establishment. He seemed friendly, fun, and sociable here, the woman recounted. He told her he was divorced, had a child, but was ready to start over. The woman invited Lex to her apartment but asked him to leave when he became too forward. On September 11th, Thomas approached her at another bar, apologized, and took a taxi with her. He asked to enter her apartment, but, according to court documents, she refused. A few hours later, she woke up and saw a man she recognized as Lex standing over her bed in an unbuttoned shirt and pants lowered to his knees. The woman began screaming for him to leave her apartment immediately. She called the police and while waiting for the officers, noticed a large hole in one of the window screens, presumably how the uninvited guest gained entry. I still can't sleep at night, said the woman who left the country. At that moment, he didn't seem like himself. He had a crazy look. Thomas Lex was then charged with two offenses, burglary and malicious destruction of property. The police didn't attempt to charge him with a sexual offense because he wasn't completely naked. He was wearing underwear and boxers. He was arrested and released on bail. He continued to evade serious consequences. The registry described his risk level as high. This was the man who abducted Sarah. Amy had no idea that each time she let him into her home with her children, she was allowing a monster inside. Lex lived just a few kilometers away from Amy's home. He lived in a converted shed on his parents' property. We searched his shed, said Sergeant Owens. It was full of pornographic magazines and pornographic videos. So much that it sent shivers down your spine. The police knew that Thomas had a history of approaching minors. But as far as they knew, he had never killed anyone, so they hoped to find Sarah alive. There were no signs of Sarah in the shed, but based on the positive identification by her younger sister, sheriff's deputies took Thomas in for questioning, which lasted for several hours. Thomas was wearing the same clothes that Emma had described. During the questioning, denial followed denial. We got along perfectly fine, Thomas said in the recorded interview. I try to be very cautious around girls because of my past and everything. I don't stay alone with them or anything like that. And if you talk to Amy, she'll confirm that. I never wish them harm. When asked why Emma had pointed at him, Thomas said that Emma was considered a storyteller and fantasist by the whole family due to her age. Sarah's missing green toothbrush was found in Thomas Lex's pickup truck and he couldn't explain how it ended up there. The tire tracks in the snow near the family's home that night matched the treads of his car's tires. These tracks were deeper than human footprints, so they remained until morning. Thomas claimed he had been at a Salisbury bar until 1 a.m., and then he headed home. While he was indeed at the bar until 1 a.m., no one, including his parents, could confirm where he was until 7 a.m. The police checked his phone records. That night, he sent text messages to three women, wanting to meet up with them, but all of them declined. 
Around the time Sarah disappeared, his phone was pinging off different cell towers, outlining a specific area. Lex wasn't at home, as he claimed. He was in a wooded area far from the town where he lived. Christmas morning arrived. On Christmas Day, the town of Salisbury witnessed the best and worst of humanity. Despite it being Christmas, thousands of people took to the streets. Thousands of volunteers helped search for Sarah in the designated area in the cold woods. My breath was taken away, recalled Sarah's mother, Jennifer. They weren't concerned about the cold. They weren't concerned about missing Christmas with their families. A civilian cavalry of 3,000 people was so extensive that the sheriff had to use the local baseball stadium as a command center. Over 3,000 people put their holiday plans aside to spend Christmas searching for the child. Miracles happened on this day before and can happen again, one woman told a reporter. Police officers from all over the state arrived for the search. They combed the area with canine dogs. Helicopters were deployed to survey the area from the air. The day before, Sheriff Lewis had declared, I ask that as soon as you've searched your property, just tie a yellow ribbon around your mailbox, he said. And when he took off in a helicopter to search, he saw that absolutely everyone had done it. Everyone was so united. Despite the freezing temperatures, divers plunged into local lakes and rivers. But there was no Christmas miracle. On December 25th, around 4 p.m., Sarah's body was found in a wooded area in Wicomico County, not far from the Maryland-Delaware border, about 20 kilometers from her home. Her body lay on her back, reaching her small hands toward the sky. When I saw her and what he had done to her, and when I saw what was left of her, it was very difficult, the police officers cried. Everyone was in pain. If there ever was a case that warranted the death penalty, this was it, Sheriff Lewis said. Lex used Sarah. The autopsy revealed multiple injuries on her body. He tried to strangle her with his hands. There were bruises on her neck. She kept breathing. He tried to drown her in a dirty puddle. She had water in her lungs. Then he left, took a gasoline can, returned, doused her body with gasoline, and set her on fire. The autopsy showed that she had inhaled smoke. She was still alive. Sarah trusted him, considered him her friend. He cruelly, for so long and painfully, took her life. Thomas Lex was charged with murder. The case against him was strong. Even the dog knew him and didn't raise an alarm. He knew where the spare key to the door was hidden and also knew where Sarah slept. The girl trusted him and could have gone with him. Emma saw him in the bedroom and identified him from several people in the lineup. Sarah's toothbrush was found in his car. Sarah's hair and fibers from christmas themed pajama pants were found on the passenger seat. Tire tracks from his 2003 Dodge Ram pickup truck were preserved in the snow outside Amy's house. Lex was in the same area where the abducted body was found. The turning point in this case was that DNA on his underwear matched the DNA found on Sarah's body. For prosecutor Abby Marsh, Lex's case had a personal touch. She was the prosecutor in his first sexual offense case. Back then, Lex was sentenced to five years in prison. But what absolutely, in her opinion, defies any understanding, he was released on parole after just four months for good behavior, and such a lenient punishment could ultimately lead to an escalation of the crime, that is, murder. He shouldn't have been let out of prison so quickly each time, Prosecutor Marsh said. If he had remained incarcerated, Sarah could still be alive. The state of Maryland wanted to seek the death penalty, but before the case went to trial, Lex made a deal in exchange for his life. He pleaded guilty to all charges and was sentenced to two life imprisonments without the possibility of parole. Just a few days after arriving in prison, Lex was attacked by fellow inmates in the cafeteria. He was struck three times in the head, neck, and arm. Sarah is now considered a Christmas angel in Salisbury. Her legacy will serve to protect other children through Sarah's law. It mandates that all offenders who commit sexual crimes against children in Maryland serve a minimum of 15 years in prison without the possibility of parole.